subjects, so it's a good thing you're here so we can cover them. So. I was going to say Taylor Ginch, but that'd get me in trouble, right? Uh, it's not my middle name. Oh, okay. Taylor Ginch Dykstra. Give her a big hand. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Excited to be here today. Uh, the, um, unfortunately, I didn't get to hear all the wonderful teachings yesterday. So I hope this kind of fits together. Um, this morning, I am going to talk to you guys about mercy. Um, so uh, I know this weekend is about looking at our lives and how we want to build up and enhance our relationship with God. And so as you're looking at building your relationship with God, um, the important thing to consider is mercy. And I think mercy, when I was first looking at this topic, is kind of a confusing term. Um, I think people in the world today use the term mercy somewhat erroneously. Like they kind of add a negative connotation, like almost like it's pity or it's just like, I don't know, probably. I just think mercy has been caught up in a bunch of cute catchphrases over the last century that sort of muddled the understanding of the word mercy. And in fact, I tried to check, like, what does the dictionary say about mercy? And even the dictionary doesn't know it because it had, like, five different, totally different things. And I was like, dictionaries. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, so some examples of what it said, it's like, they couldn't just explain mercy. They had to turn it into a phrase to explain it. So they're like, you're at the mercy of. So, like, no way to protect yourself, you know. Or it's, uh, may God have mercy on us, such as like a, um, you know, asking for divine favor. Um, and then there's, uh, oh, they had mercy on that poor soul, which is, you know, compassion and kindness, which is probably the closest to what we're going to look at biblically. And then there's, um, you know, like, thank heavens for small mercies, uh, you know, which is like, Thank goodness it isn't worse, right? Um, <laughs> so these are all different definitions that all mean different things. And so when you read your Bible and you're reading about God's mercy, you know, because you grew up in the world, I'm sure you've heard these turn of phrases. And so it might get a little scrambled in your head, right? Like, what does this really mean? What is God saying to me about mercy? Um, but then you kind of write it off. You're like, well, God's good, so mercy's good, right? So it's all good. Um, <laughs> but... This morning, I would like to try to lay out a clear example of how we should interact with God's mercy toward us. Um, and at first, just as a side note, I got really excited about the mercy seat. And I was like, oh, I'm going to teach on the mercy seat. There's so many cool things to talk about. And then it's like, it's cool, like history and information, but not also like really great at building our relationship with God. So I, I just like, you guys should look it up. Look up the mercy seat. It's super cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, where am I? So let's start in our Bibles in uh, the book of First Samuel. So turn to First Samuel, chapter sixteen, um, to help us visualize interacting with God's mercy. We're going to look at David this morning. Uh, just as a quick uh, comprehension check, could you raise your hand if you are familiar with the story of David? All right, cool. That's pretty good. Uh, it's okay if you're not familiar. We'll read it. Uh, well, we'll read bits of it. So. Yeah, 1 Samuel 16, um, let's just jump in. Um, we're going to read verse 13. It says, uh, so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. And then Samuel went wrong. Okay, so this is just the end of the story where um, Samuel is anointing David. David is called out from amongst his brothers, and he basically gets spirit, right? Uh, he's anointed by Samuel, and this is important because this happens very early in David's life, that he gets spirit, and this God's spirit is guiding him, including his conquering of Goliath. He's got God's spirit when he does that. He's got God's spirit guiding him from this point forward. So I just want to set the tone that in context, David's living with God's uh, anointing on him. Um, and then uh, let's flip over to chapter 7 uh, of 1 Samuel. So, this might be a typo. I might want you to be in 2 Samuel. Hold on a second. 
Yeah, it's Second Samuel. Let's go to Second Samuel seven. Second Samuel. Yeah, sorry about that. I wrote first Samuel, but it's second Samuel. Okay, so um, then we know that uh, the prophet Nathan was at work at this time, and um, God is speaking here in this next section to David um, through the prophet. Okay, and this is a really a uh, nice time of David's life coming up here where he is um, having a lot of victories, you know, overcoming Saul, and you guys know the story. So in verse chap uh, chapter 7, verse 12, where is it? we will read, Oh, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over, and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come up out of your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. So what we read here is God making a promise to David, um, saying, David, I'm going to establish your house. I'm going to give you a kingdom forever through your bloodline. And so that's a pretty exciting promise for David. He's probably like, hey, thanks, God. That's great. Awesome. Um, and in fact, uh, if we read David's response to hearing this wonderful revelation, we can learn a lot about how David interacts with the Lord. So let's read that as well. That starts, uh, let's read in 7, uh, verse 18. We'll keep reading. And then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? As And as if this were not enough in your sight, O sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. Is this your usual way of dealing with man, O Sovereign Lord? What more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Sovereign Lord, for the sake of your word and according to your will. You have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. How great you are, O Sovereign Lord. So you're seeing here that David is calling himself God's servant, right? He's referring to himself as God's servant. Like, I am not worthy. Like, is this how you treat men? Why are you bestowing all of this wonderful promise to me? Um, mm -hmm. He says, God, there is no one like you, and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth, that God went out to redeem as a people for himself, and to make a name for himself, and to perform great and awesome wonders by driving out nations and their gods from before your people, whom you redeemed out of Egypt. You have established your people Israel as your very own forever, and you, O Lord, have become their God. And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. So here's interesting. David requests of God. He's like, you made this promise. Keep it. Please. Like, right? He's saying, please keep your promise. It's kind of like, was he <coughs> questioning this promise? Did he really believe it? Um, he says, please keep the servant, you know, or this promise you made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you promised so that your name will be great forever. And then men will say, the Lord Almighty is God over Israel, and the house of your servant David will be established before you. So he's not asking for it for his own glory. He's asking it for it for God's glory, and that he is showing his heart. He's desirous to do this thing that God has promised, but he knows that he can't do it in his own strength, that he needs God to do it. So anyway, David has a lot of blessings early in his life, but now let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. <clears throat> So I'm not going to read this whole section, but if you're familiar, you might see the title here. My NIV says, David and Bathsheba at the beginning of chapter 11. But in verse 2, we're just going to read verses 2 through 5 just to give you a little snippet. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, Isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And then David sent a messenger to get her. She came to him, and he's loved with her. She had pur purified herself from her uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I'm pregnant. 
Uh, <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> okay, so if you're not super familiar with this account, from this point forward, things get really bad for David. Um, so what happened? What happened? He was all on fire for the Lord, like, give me this promise. You know, did he lose his spirit like Saul? Well, no. Um, David knew and understood God's wisdom. He loved God, and he yearned to do right in God's eyes and wanted to fulfill that promise. But sometimes, despite knowing all those things, even with spirit on us, we can make mistakes, and we can do things that are wrong. And even though he loved God, um, he is just a man. I mean, Romans 7, you don't have to turn there because I'm going to read from the Amplified Bible, tells us uh, in verse 15, for I do not understand my own actions. I am baffled and bewildered by them. I do not practice what I want to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate and yielding to my human nature, my worldliness, my sinful capacity. Right? That is how <laughs> David is in this moment. That is often how we are in moment to moment. Right? That is a part of our human nature as old as Adam. Um, so, uh, David, I should kind of point, wasn't born again like we are, but he was anointed with spirit. So he knew God's commands. Uh, he was able to walk with the Lord. But in this moment, at this time with Bathsheba, I'm going to say he became complacent. He became a little lazy in his obedience to God. And he began taking God for granted because God had been so good to him for so long. It was easy to just assume that things were going to keep going well. Uh, but if you look back at verse 1 of chapter 11, it tells us, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David, who was the king, by the way, sent Joab out with the king's men in the whole uh, Israelite army. They destroyed the Amorites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Huh. What? Yeah. The time when kings go out to battle, you're going to hang out in Jerusalem? Why did you do that? Was that obeying the Lord? What? To understand why he did this, um, you don't have to turn there. Deuteronomy 17 has some guidelines for what kings need to do, right? So David, being the king, should have been following these guidelines. So let me read it to you. You can turn there if you would like. Deuteronomy 17, verse 16. It says, but the, uh, I'm sorry, but the king must not acquire many horses for himself or send the people back to Egypt to acquire more horses. But the Lord had said, you are never to go back that way again. And he must not take many wives for himself, lest his heart go astray. And he must not accumulate for himself large amounts of silver and gold. When he is seated on his royal throne, he must write for himself a copy of this instruction on a scroll in the presence of Levitical priests. It is to remain with him, and he is to read from it all the days of his life. Wow. All the days of his life. So that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this instruction and these statutes. Then his heart will not be exalted above his countrymen, and he will not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, in order that he and his sons may reign many years over the kingdom of Israel. So you can see here, David did not do this. He exalted himself above his countrymen by thinking, oh, I don't need to go to battle with them. Right? He exalted himself above his countrymen for whatever the reason. We don't know. Maybe it was power or fear or laziness or complacency. It doesn't really matter. Whatever the purpose was, I think we know he wasn't reading that reminder every day, every morning when he woke up, like, oh, yeah, God doesn't want me to do this. Right? So the result is clear. <laughs> he let God's words depart from his eyes and his heart for enough time to allow himself to break the guidelines in verse 17. He committed adultery with Bathsheba, in essence, taking her as another wife, which he also had, never mind. And then taking, <laughs> <laughs> but thus taking many wives for himself and, you know, lusting after the flesh. This caused his heart to go astray. And then after this, David continues to make mistake after mistake in his eagerness to repair the damage he caused. So the good thing is, like, he had a repentant heart. He wants to fix it. He's like, oh, uh, but he's hasty. He's hasty to cover his sin. He, and in his haste, he has Uriah killed, which is the husband of Bathsheba, and also some innocent soldiers. You know, but he does a pretty good job making all of this covering look credible and good on the outside. I mean, I'm going to paraphrase here just for the sake of time. But first, he tries the most logical thing, like, oh, man, she's pregnant. All right, we got to get her husband in here, okay, and uh, make it look like it's his baby. But that doesn't work because Uriah uh, follows the principles that God instructs him to do. So that didn't work. Oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? So David's like, it's okay. We're about to have a war battle. 
we'll just have a, a battle and he'll die in the battle, right? And he kind of sets that up, have the husband conveniently killed um, in battle. Well, I actually read a commentary that was really interesting about this. It doesn't have a lot of scriptural backing, but it, it makes sense log logically. So I'll just tell you the commentary laid claim that then after Uriah is killed, David uses Uriah's death to become Bathsheba's kinsman redeemer, which would allow him to take her into his house and have a legitimate child with her. Um, an interesting theory, and if it is true, what an interesting cover story that makes for David very convenient and very um, looking, you know, honorable to the people of Israel that he would do something like that. It's okay, but you know what? It's all a cover. It's just a covering for sin. Um, you know, we know that when we make mistakes, big mistakes, even when we're walking in fellowship with God, our instinct is to hide. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden on the cool day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the, presence of the Lord among God's, I'm sorry, read correctly, Mrs. Dexter, from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Adam and Eve hid from God. Okay, But David knew that his coverings could appease the people for a short time, but in his heart he knew it couldn't cover his, his sin from God. So turn to Psalm 51 for me. I'm going to start reading um, Psalm 51. David wrote this thing, uh, this thing, this psalm after this experience with Bathsheba. Nathan the prophet kind of calls him out on it, and he he writes some of this. I was going to read the whole thing, but I might not. So let's just start. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgression. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. I feel like this introduction to the psalm is really powerful for anybody who's made a mistake that they feel really guilty about, right? Like, not, I mean, maybe you didn't kill a guy, but, you know, maybe you did. I don't know. Um, but whatever you're dealing with, right, if you made some kind of a mistake, right, your transgression is always before you. I think we have a hard time forgiving ourselves. We live in guilt. And here it says, against you, only you have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. When you're walking with God's spirit, you especially know when you've sinned. You're like, dang it, I missed the mark, and I should know better. I have God's spirit. What happened? Right? But anyway, and it says, so that you are proved right when you speak. You are justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, and surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with his up, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed Rejoice. Hide your face from my sin. Blot out my iniquity. <clears throat> Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So this psalm, I think when you read the whole thing, it kind of reads more like a prayer, like David's praying more than a, a song. But I think it clearly conveys David's relationship with God in this moment. David's hurting, and he, he sees his mistakes. He sees his failures. He sees his sin, and he's living with regret. But he's not feeling sorry for himself. He calls God just. He asks God to fix his heart. He says, create in me a pure heart, God. He wants God to fix his heart. So rather than running and continuing to hide from God uh, or expecting his man-made covers to shield him, he confesses that he needs God. And he requests openly. He requests the mercy. He says, I need mercy. Um, and the type of mercy he's requesting is the biblical kind of mercy, not the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary kind. <laughs> He's requesting kindness or favor to an inferior, which we're all inferior to God, if you didn't know that. <laughs> so David requests mercy from God in this psalm because in his heart he knows that he knows what he deserves is actually death. And he confesses as much to Nathan the prophet when he calls him out. Uh, we can go back to 2 Samuel. Uh, he says in chapter 12, I think it is. Yeah, Nathan rebukes David. Uh, so basically, Nathan kind of tells a little story, paraphrase for you, of like, oh, yeah, some guys treating people bad, blah, blah, blah. And then David gets to he's like, oh, what a terrible story. Verse 5, David burned with anger against the men. He said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, that man 
who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that land four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And then Nathan said to David, you are the man. <laughs> this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives to your arms. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the work of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? And then, you know, continues to call out his, his mistakes. Um, so I'm sure when David wrote Psalm 51, I'm sure he was thinking, oh, did I not read the end? Oh, all right, important. Okay. He basically, uh, Nathan says that the child that Bathsheba is pregnant with is going to die. That's what this section ends with. And... So when David wrote Psalm 51, I'm sure he was imagining what he thought God's mercy should look like. Like, please don't let this child die. He was picturing what he wanted God's mercy to look like. Please undo this bad thing that I did. Um, and many people would argue that God does not grant mercy to David after Psalm 51 because the child, spoiler, does die. Um, and eventually his other sons die as well. And his whole household pretty much falls apart. Um, but... David, actually, instead of being sad and poor me and all these bad things, he realized that he realizes that God did, in fact, grant mercy to him and shows him um, the mercy that he requests, although not in the way that he thought. Um, so Samuel 7, again, if we go back. First Samuel? Uh, no, I think that's a typo on my notes. I think it's Second Samuel. <laughs> yeah, Second Samuel. 11. I'm going to remind you of the promise God made. It says, The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will rise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Okay. Um, that David said to Nathan, his own actions, this man who's done this thing, he deserves death. And his failure to uphold the guidelines of a king in Deuteronomy also makes him unworthy to be part of the kingly line. Mm -hmm. um, his punishment as a result of these actions is death on his child and his children and the end of his kingly line, essentially. And yet, Bathsheba, right? And yet Bathsheba. Um, so that is chapter 12, I think. Yes. Uh, Second Samuel chapter 12. I turn my page to you, Verse 24. Mm. Yes. Um, after a time of mourning was over, David brought her to his house. This is after the child had died. And then she became his wife and bore him a son. Um, oh, wait. Is that the son Solomon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then they named him Solomon. Um, and that might not be exactly the right verse. Sorry, team. But basically, after their child dies, she gets pregnant and she has another son. And they call him Solomon. Uh, in fact, First Chronicles outlines that Bathsheba actually has four sons with um, David, um, Nathan, and Solomon. Both happen to be part of the Christ line. And so even though David deserved death for his actions, even though you know Bathsheba probably shouldn't have been part of the kingly line or anything, he shouldn't have deserved to keep his kingship line, God shows mercy to David by preserving the kingly line for Christ. Um, and you can see that lineage in Matthew 1, Luke 3. But uh, his line is not fully cut off. Second Samuel 21, and I'll us to read as well. See it again. What is it? Oh, sorry. No, let's just skip that one. Okay. So basically, um, we know that David is repentant. Oh, 21. Yeah, 22. It might have been 22. Sorry, team. Second Samuel 22. Second Samuel 22. Okay. Sorry. 
Do a little too much copying and pasting and the numbers got messed up. So 2 Samuel 22, um, verse 2. It says, he said, the Lord is my rock. This is David talking, my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge and my savior. From violent men you save me. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I am saved from my enemies. The waves of death swirled around me. The torments of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. And the snares of death confronted me. And in my distress... I called to the Lord. I called out to my God. And from his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came to his ears. And that hearing is actually uh, an attentive listening with a positive response. That's what that means in, in the original language. Attentive listening with a positive response. So we know David is still repentant of his bad choices, but he's not living in guilt. Here he is confessing, I went to God, and God save me, right? He, if you continue to read this, which is actually, I think also Psalm 18, he is full of thankfulness and gratefulness towards God. And he's fully aware of the mercy that God showed him um, by allowing him to have Solomon and Nathan and, and these other children, even though there should have been an end to his line. Um, and that's God's mercy at work in his life. You know, if you look at Matthew 1, which you don't need to, but it goes over the genealogy of Jesus and uh, it includes like Rahab, Ruth, Tamar, and Bathsheba. None of these women were meant to be part of a kingly line of descendants. You know, Jesus's ancestors are Gentiles and adulterers and prostitutes <laughs> and heroes and patriarchs, right? But that's God's mercy at work, right? Bringing people into his fold. Um, I, I've heard people sum up the difference between grace and mercy like this. Uh, grace is getting something you don't deserve life. Mercy is God withholding what you do deserve, which is death. And those concepts are very intertwined, but I don't think it quite covers it all, because as I was studying the section of David, it's really about mercy is also favor and kindness to someone considered inferior. And that doesn't necessarily mean pity, like we hear it and we think pity. It doesn't mean pity, it means favor. Favor and kindness. Um, so keep that in mind when you're thinking about uh, mercy. I want to quickly summarize the, the steps of David that we just read. Um, so David, right? Walk in and fellowship with God. Walk in the spirit. Everything's good. Uh-oh, makes a huge mistake. Okay? Tries to cover, hide, and mask his guilt and shame. Finally, goes to God and asks with a willing heart for his guilt to be removed. He asks God for mercy. Then he's got all about some of the consequences of his actions. But God gives mercy where there should have been death. And his, uh, some of his children survive. So, therefore, God's promise to David is still fulfilled. Therefore, David is thankful and blessed. Okay? This is real life, people. Okay? <laughs> when we read that God is merciful, like, it's nice to think about. It's important to believe. But if you've ever lived in need of God's mercy, it's easier said than done. And I think that the seven things that David kind of goes through, those steps I just laid out, can happen to any one of us. You know? So I was hoping to make this teaching about interacting with God's mercy. And so I think we see that David had to interact with God. He talked to God. God responded. He goes to God. It's a relationship. So right now I want you guys to consider where are you today in your walk with God? Are you fellowshipping? Everything is good. Walking in the spirit, you know, forgiven, blessed, not hiding anything. Or are you in the midst of recovering from a mistake? Are you hiding still? Have you earnestly gone to God for help? Are you willing to admit your mistakes? And are you just wanting it fixed for you? Or are you wanting it fixed for God? Mm -hmm. Jesus says in Matthew 13, Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but the sinner. And David reiterates this in Psalm 51 as well. He says, For you do not delight in sacrifice, or else I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. My only sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, broken with sorrow for sin, thoroughly penitent. Such, God, such oh God, you will not despise. So have you repented of your mistakes? Um, have you had that broken spirit for a minute that's truly repented and saying, No, God, I, 
I did this bad thing. Please heal my heart. Um, because if you have, good, that's good for the soil, for God's mercy to flourish in your heart. You don't have to stay sorrowful for your mistakes. You don't have to stay broken with a contrite heart all the rest of your days. Um, God was merciful to David despite his failure. And David was humble enough to accept God's mercy. That's why it's an interaction. You have to accept God's mercy. It's a relationship. You can't just expect it to fall on you if the condition of your heart isn't right. So 1 John chapter 3 talks a little bit about the condition of our heart. Um, and you can turn to 1 John chapter 3. I'm going to start in verse 19. It says, By this shall we know that we are the truth and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandment abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So you see, if your heart or David's heart have con continues on in guilt and condemnation all the time, then there's really no room for God's mercy to come in. You know, God knows your heart anyway. He knows what's going on with you. You can't hide. Um, you might be able to make it look really nice on the outside like David did, but he knows what's going on on the inside. And this verse reminds us that because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him, we can have confidence that we can obtain God's mercy. When we ask for God's mercy, we can receive God's mercy. So, And don't let the commandment heart fool you. Sometimes that throws me off if I'm like having a bad day. I'm like, oh, commandments, oh no. But like, it's not about rules, you know? It's about, it tells us right here, walk in love, believe in Jesus Christ. And you can still do those two things. If you can still do those two things today, walk in love and believe in Jesus Christ, then you don't have to have condemnation in your heart. You don't have to have condemnation over your choices because God is rich in mercy. So be like David and let God's mercy into your heart. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3, and we're almost done. I'm watching the time. Sorry, you're burning on all this. I'm over four minutes. We're almost done. Mercy. Okay, three, twelve, seven. James is at the top really quick. No, I think that's not. <laughs> okay, so it says, see to our brothers that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, for as long as for, for as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. What verse are you in? I am in Hebrews 3:12. <laughs> okay, so it is possible. What this verse is saying is it is possible to have your heart hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And not only is it possible, it's actually quite common, I would argue, that it's part of our human nature, okay? Um, but daily, we need to encourage each other. Just like David was supposed to daily remind himself of what the king's, you know, guidelines were, okay? Hebrews 4, uh, verse 14, also continues on to say, therefore, since we have a great high priest, sorry, 4, 14, who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For if we do not have, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. The ESV Study Bible had a fantastic note on this, and it, I'm just going to read it to you, and then we're going to close. The encouragement to draw near to God. I'm sorry, the encouragement to draw near to God's throne implies that Christians have the privilege of a personal relationship with God. Confidence here translates boldness, confidence, courage, with reference to speaking before someone of great rank and power. It indicates that Christians may come before God and speak plainly and honestly with appropriate reverence without fear that they will incur shame or punishment by doing so. God the Father, with Jesus at his right hand, graciously dispenses help from heaven to those who need forgiveness and strength in temptation. Awesome. <laughs> right? So biblical mercy uh, defined as kindness or favor shown to an inferior. And like I said, we're definitely inferior to God. But because of Jesus Christ, we do not need to fear shame or punishment when we make a mistake because God will graciously dispense mercy to us. David had to endure some punishment for his actions. 
and he asked for mercy and he received enough that now we too can have mercy because of Jesus. Okay. Without, but without the condemnation, without the punishment, because we're part of a better covenant. So turn to Psalm 25. This is where we're going to close. Um, and uh, I thought this is a really beautiful psalm written by David. Uh, it's probably very beautiful in Hebrew because supposedly the psalm is like the beginning of each verse. is a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is kind of cool. But anyway, that's not why we're reading it. We're reading it. I think we're going to read it right now as our closing as like a prayer. Okay. So as I read this, if any of you feel like in your heart today, you're like needing forgiveness, you're needing mercy, you need strengthening, you need encouragement from God, I want you to like pray this psalm in your head as we read it out loud, okay? All right, here we go. This is from the ESV. Of David to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Oh my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your path. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions according to your steadfast love. Remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimony. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble, and forgive all my sin. Consider how many are my foes, and with what violent hatred they hate me. Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me while I wait for you. Amen.